Okay, welcome back. Here is the next lesson on factoring. This is probably the last uh, fundamental lesson that you'll see. And then after this lesson, I'll do a review video with a bunch of tough questions. Perfect square trinomials. So what the heck are those? Well, a perfect square trinomial has a very specific form, which is as follows. A plus B, all squared. Whenever you see this pattern, you always end up with the following expansion. The middle term is always going to be a double or an even value. And the uh, first and last terms and their coefficients will always be perfect squares. So let's take a look at some questions. The first four examples are very mechanical and you could actually answer them without knowing this lesson based on prior experience and prior lessons with me. Here we go. Let's factor this trinomial. Now, maybe you don't recognize it as a perfect square trinomial, but that doesn't matter. So let's just factor it the way we normally do, which is to look for two numbers that multiply to nine and add to six. Remember, we add to this number here and we multiply to that number there because the coefficient in front is a one. The numbers are clearly three and three. We can go through the decomposition method. You could definitely skip this step if you prefer, but I'll just go through it as a review. Perhaps I'll skip the step on the next uh, few examples. In the grouping step here, we can take an X out of the first two terms, leaving us with X plus three. And in the second pair of terms, we can take a three out, leaving us again with X plus three. Notice that we have X plus three duplicate twice. And that's the key thing here to notice. When the two binomials that you factor are identical, you can write them as a single binomial and then put a all squared around that. This is a perfect square trinomial. There are patterns that you can look for and we'll discuss the patterns as we go through the next three examples. All right, in this example, we want two numbers that multiply to 25 and add to 10. Those numbers are five and five. Since the number repeats itself twice, we know that we're going to expect a perfect square trinomial. Notice here, I'm gonna skip that middle step, the decomposition, since we've practiced it many times already. This binomial appears twice, meaning that again, we have a perfect square, there it is. So let's talk about patterns for a second. So how are these numbers connected? So we have x plus five, then we square it, and then we get x squared plus 10x plus 25. What you notice is the following. This is because we have a monic trinomial or a one in front. You always get a middle term, which is double whatever that number is. And the final term is always the square of that number there. See, five times two and five squared. You can go backwards also by dividing by two and taking a square root. What happens if there isn't a one in front? Well, we'll deal with that very shortly. One more here with a negative sign. We want to multiply to 81 and add to negative 18. Those numbers are negative nine and negative nine. Since the number repeats itself, we know that it is a perfect square because we write it twice. And when you write something twice, you can use a squared operator to simplify it and make it look like a perfect square. Okay, next example. We have a number in the front here that is not a one, but there is something that gives us a hint that this is a perfect square. The number in the front here, the four, is actually a perfect square. It's two squared. Also, the coefficient at the back here is nine, which is three squared. This is a clue that potentially we have a perfect square trinomial. So keep that in mind in a little bit. Let's go through the factoring process, uh, assuming that you didn't identify that it potentially is a perfect square trinomial. Remember, four times nine here, not just the nine. So four times nine is 36. That's what you're searching for. So the numbers are six and six. 
Because the coefficient in the front is not a one, I'm not gonna take any shortcuts here. I'll go through the full decomposition. So x squared, four x squared plus six x plus six x plus nine. We can do a grouping step here, giving us two x and then two x plus three. Followed by the second pair of terms. Let me just do that a little bit nicer there. And we can take a three out, leaving us with two x plus three. Notice that the two x plus three appears twice. That means that it is common to both of those expressions. So we get two x plus three, and we also get two x plus three again, meaning that this is a perfect square trinomial. So how do these numbers connect? Well, it's this simple. If the top number here is a perfect square and the back number is a perfect square, take the two and the three and you multiply them. So what's two times three? Six. And then you always multiply by two. And notice that you get 12. That's the key. That when you take the square root of this number and the square root of this number and you multiply them and double your answer, you get the number in the middle here, the 12. Now, this number in the middle here, the coefficient could be plus or minus. So we're going to take a look at a bit of uh, more challenging questions in a moment. So be prepared to brush up on your algebra. So here come four questions that in grade 10 would be on the tougher side, but in grade 11 would be expected on a factoring test. Okay, so here are some examples uh, that we're going to look at where you have to solve for a parameter, in this case, k, so that this expression is a perfect square trinomial. In this case, the middle coefficient is given. So remember that to get to the middle coefficient, you would multiply by two. So to get to the other coefficients, you would divide by two. So if we take eight and divide by two, we get four. And if then, if you wanna get this coefficient here, simply square it. So k is actually equal to 16. Now, you might be like, I don't really follow that. Maybe, maybe can I do it a different way? And the answer is, yeah, you could. You can do some uh, stuff on the side here, like multiply and add. So you want to multiply to k, and you want to add to 8. But what the two numbers have to be, they have to be the same. c and c, for example. So if you follow it that way, you could solve it algebraically. And uh, I mean, I can try it, but I don't want you to worry too much if you figure it out this way already. So let me just give it a shot here. I haven't rehearsed this, so this should be interesting. So we want 2c equal to 8, because c plus c has to equal 8. And then we want c times c to be k, so c squared equals k. Oh, look at that, you got some algebra. So you can solve that and get c equals 4. And then you can plug in 4 for c there, and get k equals 16. Now, I did a little bit weird, but this actually works really well. So let's experiment with the next question and see how that goes. Okay, so in this case, we want the middle term to be uh, the parameter that we're looking for. So notice that we have a one in front, so we're not too worried about the leading term, but we can take the nine here and square root it and get three. Now remember to go to the middle, you gotta double it. So what's two times three? Six. So we know the answer is that k can be six. However, when you have perfect square trinomials, the middle term can also be negative. So we gotta work our way back here and identify not just the six, but the potential that you have a negative six. So there's two answers here for this question. Here's another one where the leading coefficient is not a one and the back coefficient k is what you're looking for, the constant. So I'm gonna try this one out the other way where I did my multiply and add uh, scenario. So we want two numbers that multiply to 4k because it's four times k that is the product that you're looking for and you want a sum of 20. Assuming that those two numbers are the same, we'll call them c and c, we can solve eventually for that answer. So notice that we have 2c, the middle term, is 20. Because the two numbers c have to add up to 20. 
And we also know that c squared equals 4k. So if we do the math here, we get c equals 10. We can plug in 10 here and get 100, because 10 squared is 100. And then quickly, we get k is 25. This is actually the way that I ended up doing it as a student. And I kind of made it up on the fly for a test. Last example. And this one here is a bit tricky because the leading coefficient and the, and the constant coefficient are, are both uh, not 1. So let's look for two numbers that multiply to their product, which is 36. 4 times 9 is 36. And we want to add to k. Now, I like to use the letter c here, as you saw in the earlier examples. This c here, I don't really care what it means physically. I just know that whatever number I put here and here, they have to be the same. So don't worry about what C is. Just worry about what K is. And we'll get to that shortly. What we do know that is that the, the two values of C, so C plus C, whatever that is, has to equal K. In other words, 2C has to equal K. So I'll write that as K equals 2C. Now let's go and solve C by using the product information. We know that C times C is 6, or in other words, C squared is uh, sorry 36 now if you take the square root of 36 you're gonna get 6 you might think that's the only answer but you should always put a plus or minus sign when you take a square root so we feed that back over here and if you take 2 and multiply by 6 you get 12 but you have the plus or minus so there's two possible answers for that middle coefficient plus or minus 12 and this really is the uh, pinnacle of difficulty when it comes to those application thinking type questions that you might get on a test. So this ends the uh, fundamental factoring skills and I'd like to do one more video where I just give you a bunch of tricky questions just to make sure that you're ready for a test. Great, thank you.